Transferring wealth successfully starts with asking yourself questions that will give your family a better life now and for generations to come. In this podcast, financial professionals John and Michael from Copper Beach Financial Group guide you through eye-opening questions to help you discover the truth about your wealth. Now, on to the show. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Wealth with John and Michael Paris of Copper Beach Financial Group. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Eric. We're good. Doing great. How are and, you, sir? Oh, I'm good. You know, uh, my wife is still working from home, and I think we spoke just briefly on the last podcast, maybe, that I everything's going great, except if I could just... I'm still trying to figure out how to keep her out of my office because she wants to tidy up. She wants to organize, and I'm using air quotes on a podcast, which is very effective, but she wants to organize my office. It's my Uh-oh. office. It's my, my yeah. office. Anyway. Organized Dude. chaos is sometimes better. Thank you. Better. I love organized chaos. It's, yeah. it's great. Well, you, you guys are crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's, and, and everything's going well for you guys. You got to let it flow. <laughs> oh, exactly. Exactly. And, and we, we were speaking a little bit before the podcast. Everybody's doing well in their own self-quarantining and social distancing yes. situations. Yes. yes, we are. Yep. In fact, we you guys have, aren't uh, even in the same place right now. No, Dad, you're at the office. I'm at the office and, all by myself. I'm, yeah, and I'm in my basement. So right on, right on. We're making it work. It's the new norm. That's right. Yep. So, well, we didn't we didn't get together today to talk about our self quarantining in our basements. Although that could be an entire podcast in and of itself. I think, uh, John, if I'm not mistaken, you have a fantastic basement with uh, a lot of wine down there. So it's probably good that you're not in your basement right now. <laughs> just, but I have my... been drinking every day. Oh, good for you. <laughs> See, this is good stuff. And and if you haven't heard the last podcast that these guys put out. Uh, it was fantastic. They brought, they had a special guest. They talked about wine. I learned a ton um, that I am a heathen when it comes to wine for sure. So I'm, I'm learning from them. Please go back and listen to that podcast. But for today's podcast, Michael, I know that you're going to start this off. What are we learning about today? Well, today we probably wanted to try to keep it a bit lighter, although we'll see how light we can keep it. But we wanted to really talk about family businesses. And, and I thought it would be a good idea to really have a dialogue between my father and I, since we are a family business and we work with a lot of family mm-hmm. businesses, and really just have a conversation on things that come up in in working with a family business and and you know how we work through that uh, at Copper Beach and maybe how some of our listeners could work through that if they themselves have a family business because uh, if anyone does have a family business, you know that the dynamics are a little bit different, to say the least, between mm-hmm. oh boy, um, between that family business and maybe another business relationship you would have. So that's really the topic today that we wanted to talk about. Okay, so I've, I've got a question to kick it off. Can I start? Absolutely. How do you keep it, it separate? Right. I mean, and the, the big question: How do you keep business separate from personal in in such a way that it doesn't creep in? And, and I say that, and in, in what I mean by that is that business doesn't creep into your personal life where, because as a business owner myself, I grind. My, my brain grinds on my business constantly. I'm trying to figure out what I can do better for my clients. I'm trying to figure out what I can do to grow my business. I'm trying to figure out all the different things that I need to figure out as a business owner. And I know every business owner out there does that to some certain extent. How do you keep that from creeping into your personal relationship? And on the flip side of that coin, how do you keep the personal issues that do creep up in relationships, because I know, Michael, you have siblings as well. So, Mm -hmm. John, you have more than just one child. How do you keep all of that out of the business when it comes to maybe some hurt feelings here and there? It could be hurt feelings on a personal side compared to a business side. How do you keep that separate, guys? Dad, do you want to go? Yeah, we've been fortunate, Eric, because Michael and I have been working together over 11 years now, and we we have a, a real good relationship. We know our boundaries. So I'll leave it at that. Mm-hmm. He knows what I'm, my role is. I know what his role is, and I give him the lead to run the office. I, I kind of stay out of his way. Um, if, if you look at it this way, I'm, they recognize me being the kind of the visionary for the business where I think it should go, um, and they let me go. Um, we have weekly meetings, we talk about changes and opportunities we have as a, as a business operation. And they're always in tune with listening to me. They think I'm crazy sometimes, and mm-hmm. I mean that in a very nice way. But <laughs> my my role is to push the envelope and, and make, to your point, make us better every day. Um, 
on, on the backside, Michael and his team work on the systems, processes, relationships with uh, communication to the families we work with. So we separate it. So it's easy. It's easy for us because we're, we're also a smaller business. So it's easier for us. And Michael and I really haven't had one fight yet in 11 years, which is people tell me that's kind of uncommon. Uh, yeah. But I respect him. He respects me. And that's the first thing we should talk about. It's a respect issue. Yeah. And it's not an ego issue. And sometimes egos get in the way amongst family members, uh, people in general. Uh, but Michael and I don't have an ego issue between each other. So he respects my role. He respects my uh, longevity in the business, my history, uh, my, you know, my thinking of how businesses should be run. But yet Michael always comes in with input that says maybe, you know, Dad, I, I like that idea, but maybe we should think of it about it this way. So together we, we manage that efficiently. So if, if you're a family-owned business, the first thing I would tell you to check at the front door is your ego. Mm. When you walk through that door, check your ego outside and leave it there. And, and think of it as a team and think about it as a family. Think about how we're all going to work together to make everybody successful in this adventure. So that's the first um, rule of thumb, I would say, Le you know, check your ego at the front door and recognize the fact that everybody has a role and those roles should be respected. I don't know, Michael, if you have thought for that. Yeah, I think that that was for me personally, more of a challenge when I started because it was an adjustment for, for me to take what for pretty much most of my life was a personal relationship and now transition that into a, per a business and personal relationship. And particularly early on, uh, where I would like to think more so now, I'm more of a, a, a partner. It's more of a partnership type of conversation between my father and I. But in the early years, it was probably more of a traditional employer-employee relationship, mm -hmm. only because I was really getting my feet wet a lot. And I remember struggling with how, how do I how do I talk to my dad, who's my dad, but he's also my boss. And how do I, you know, I certainly talk to him in ways that I would not talk to another boss in the same tone because he's my father, which I think at the end of the day actually has been a positive rather than a negative because I do think it allows for more open communication. So that was uh, something that I think in, in terms of how to maybe change between the business and, and personal relationship was something that I had to learn over time. Um, getting to back to your other question, Eric, on how do we separate sort of the business and personal relationships, I think I found that the family, the other family members really help that a lot because even if we're not, if my father and I are hanging out together outside of the business, I think it's hard for us to not talk about the business mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's what we do. And most we're pretty good at it though. I think yeah. we're pretty good, but, but I think when we have the other family members around, I think they really are, are kind of that insulator yeah. for lack of a better term to be able to really keep us, you know, more present with the family and talking about, uh, the, the family issues as opposed to the the business issues that may be going on. So I, I found that relying on the other family members has been a, a pretty key part of that. Oh, and I'm, I'm sure you both have heard, you know, at least one time in, in the history of this 11 years, all right, boys, enough about business. <laughs> we're here for, we're here for family dinner or we're here for something else. And, and, uh, my wife has, has told me that on more than one occasion. Okay. Cause we'll sure. all get together with friends and we're talking about our different businesses. Okay, guys, that's, that's enough work. Let's just talk about, you know, let's talk about something different. So it's nice to have that. And I, I think you used a great word there, Michael, with they're an insulator against being drawn into too many of those conversations. You can get outside of the work environment and, and have that. And it also the, the one word that kind of kept coming back to me as you guys were both talking is trust, right? It sounds like you, you just have, you check your egos at the door, but there's a certain amount of trust that you have to place in the other person. Michael, you've got to trust your father that he's going to guide the company. He's got that vision, and and you've seen him be successful over all these years. Mm -hmm. And then, John, you're trusting Michael as he's learned and as he's grown into the position that he's in now, being more of a partner in this and being able to sit down and talk and say, okay, I trust his ideas and thoughts when he brings them to me. You're the ultimate decision maker. However, you're giving a lot more weight to what he's saying. And that, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful thing. I wish that would happen in more family businesses. And, and, and we may get into that later in the podcast, but that's something that I've seen fail miserably in businesses that uh, I've worked with as a coach, you know, because you go in and you see there's just so much tension and there's just no trust there. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, that's a, that's a huge hurdle to overcome. So, I'm going to rewind a little bit because we've talked about how you guys do this being family members, but now I want to know why you did it in the first place. So John, kind of a question for you. Why did you decide to make a family business and what was, what was it like making that decision to really bring Michael in on it? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a yeah, that's a, a a great question because it was it was it was something that kind of developed suddenly. Uh, Michael graduated college with a degree in uh, environmental management. He worked for an engineering firm for uh, I think a year. I'm mm-hmm. telling me if I'm wrong, Mike. I think it was about yep. a year. And one day we were having a conversation. Michael said to me, "Hey, Dad, I like what I'm doing, but it's not really. I think you have to look in a, at the opportunity I have in this industry. It doesn't excite me anymore. Um, how about if I come work for you?" I'm, I'm not you, but what would I do for you? And I instantly said to him, you need to be a JD. Because if if I'm going to leave my present employer, I want to open my own operation. I need a legal counsel on my team mm. to guide my families. And he said, okay. So Michael went to law school. And one of the conversations we had after he graduated law school, he said, okay, Dad, now I've, I've, I got my law degree. Do I come work for you right away or do I – work for a law firm and learn the ropes and, and show up two years later. So I said, you know, Michael, that's a good question. I said, why don't you go talk to these two attorneys that are good friends of mine and they know you, you've, you know, you've known these guys for a while and just ask them to take them out to lunch and whatever. So they both said, Michael, here's the deal. Your dad's going to pay you more. He's going to teach you a whole lot more. And he, any law firm will teach you <laughs> go work for your dad. So it was a pretty slam dunk for Michael as a, I get it. So from day one, Michael uh, was groomed by me as it relates to the industry and mm-hmm. the focus of what I needed him to do, because because attorneys are, are great practitioners, but they write documents. And I, and I challenge Michael, when you write a document, that document is a, is a living, Absolutely. breathing document. It has cash flow issues. It has estate issues. It has communication issues. It has management issues. It has distribution issues. All those are emotional if you think about the what that document ultimately accomplishes for a family. It's just not words. Those words have meanings to them. So I I taught Michael from the beginning, think about this document as someone's going to have to live with this document for their lifetime or a couple generations. It has to have a warmth to it. It has to have a structure to it. Everyone says, you know what? That's a great document. So, So Michael started with me right from the beginning, understanding the industry. And to my excitement, not only has Michael adopted the warmth it takes to do this business. He also has earned ultimate respect from not only the families we work with, but other advisors that work with him because Michael's, I'm sorry, Michael, it is what it is. He's extremely bright, got a big heart and clients pick up on that. So that component was a nice surprise to me. Not that I think Michael was a bad guy, but you don't know if he's going to like the industry. Mm -hmm. I didn't know if he was going to fall in love with what I fell in love with 30 years ago. And, and it all worked out for us, and we were very excited about that. And our growth uh, in that regard is always a focus of ours, like take it to the next level, working with families differently. Uh, like I know we talked in the past about the backstage of, of a family. When someone passes away or there's a major change in a family, who's there to manage all those changes for the family members that are remaining? Mm-hmm. And that's our role. So our role has changed over time. It hasn't changed focusly of what we do, but we modify as families' needs change on expecting us to do certain things for them. Hope that wasn't too far off track, but that's that was my thought initially when Michael came on board to teach him not only the business, but the warmth it takes to be in this business and do the right document reviews and drafts to make sense to the families. No, I think that's great, and I, I appreciate those. Those were my main questions. I know that you guys have a wealth of knowledge, um, and I'd just like to kind of hear you guys talk about what you've experienced over the years when it comes to family business and, and different things that you've had to overcome and, and different things that you've done to help your clients uh, realize kind of the same successes that you guys have had as a family business. So I'm just going to sit back and let you guys go from here, but those were the main two questions I really wanted to know, and, and thank you so much for that insight. Great. Yeah, that that was that was uh, that was very nice of you. I wonder if you were saying that. You're not gonna get a raise, so forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I was I was wondering if you were saying that uh, at me, as me being your son or me being an employee. I wonder if you would have that same uh, mentality if it was employee, a, a regular employee, as opposed to your son. But that was very nice of you. Um, thank you. And and right back at you. I think for me, in terms of why I wanted to to be in a family business, uh, I. I well, first off, I grew up watching my father in this business, so um, I had that, I guess, inside information, if you will, in terms of what it was like to work in this in this business. But I did see, you know, the relationships he had with his clients, um, how he was viewed by his clients and his peers in the industry, and uh, that that's fairly infectious, I think, 
in terms of if you're a young adult struggling to figure out what you want to do with your life, it's it's nice to have that as a benchmark, if you will, to be able to um, strive for that. So that was a big that was a big thing uh, for me in in trying to figure it all out. Uh, but you know, it's also nice to own your own business. I think you learn a lot about life, and I'm sure you can attest to that as well, Eric, in terms of. Mm-hmm. The, the type of things that you get involved in, you know, we have to be good, uh, obviously, in, in the financial uh, services world, but we also have to understand how to run a business. And, you know, if you're a widget maker, you have to not only know how to make the widget, but you also have to be cognizant of how to sell the widget and, you know, marketing and uh, recruiting talent and yep. HR. And so I think, you know, running a business in, in, in general is always nice to be able to sort of become, I think, a pretty well-rounded person and then having the family dynamics on top of it is great. You know, you get to work with your, with, uh, you know, your dad every day. That's, that's a great thing. So. Yeah. In the past, when I worked with families, uh, um, a while back, or even now we, we have conversations that are kind of different with the spouses. Now I usually have a conversation with, with the, with the wife who's not working in the business typically, at least the clients I've worked with in the past. And they struggle with, you know, why does my husband work 90 hours a week? And I try to explain to them that you now have, you have two children and they say, yeah, well, no, you have three. The other child is the business Mm -hmm. and your, and your husband spends 90% of his time working with that child or that business. And it's, and it's a, it's an understanding you have to have because that's part of his life. Maybe not as much as yours, but it's part of his life because that's what drives the success of the entire family. If he makes that child successful, every other child in that family is going to be as successful going forward. So it's really getting the emotional connections between the spouses and the stand, why are we doing all this? What's the mission statement? We talk about that in our planning as well. We, we brought that up in previous podcasts. But that mission statement has a lot to do with how the families work together. So that, that, that document has a very important role when it comes to understanding why we're doing what we're doing. And is it a, is it a goal of our family to do this for this goal? And the answer is no one really knows initially in the beginning, but it drives that messaging over time that, yeah, this can work for all of us. And this could be a succession to the rest of the family members, and this could work for us. So that owning your own business, to Michael's point, is very exciting, but it's also extremely risky. Mm -hmm. And that's really where the personalities come into play, where there are people that are risk takers and the people that are not risk takers. Like I am a risk taker, and I think you are too, Eric. People who run businesses have a vision to say, you know what, I want to do this. I want to make this work. And they'll sacrifice everything. Now, people probably don't know this, but the average person who's been majorly successful in his life has probably failed between five and seven times Mm -hmm. before he became successful. Every study, every book you read will tell you that. So because you fail at one thing doesn't mean you can't be successful, but that takes a lot of courage. Gets back to that. How do I, how do I build the right team of people to give me that courage to move forward and keep fighting the fight every day to grow the enterprise? So it's, so it's interesting when you look at the dynamics of how families support each other, but that's a critical part. Uh, and Michael, you, you've seen that with families. That supported the spouses to the husband working in the family 90 hours a week mm-hmm. and trusting to doing the right thing is important. Mom's never bugged me about working the hours I've worked with because she knows the end result is that we're going to be successful as a family. Yeah, I think you touched on a, a, a key part, Dad, that I've, I've, well, I, I noticed personally with our business, but I also see that with a lot of the family businesses that we work with. And you, you mentioned taking risk. And one of the, I think, the benefits of starting a business and, and, ta- and taking that risk is, is the satisfaction of having that become successful after, you know, those failures. Hopefully they're not as many as those failures, but that, that's a part of, uh, that's part of life. But I think for me, the, the, one of the challenges that I had was I didn't have to take that same risk that you did to start the business because I'm I'm coming into an already to some degree a pretty well established and successful company, and I think that that dynamic is something that is particularly for the second generation something that they really have to uh, overcome in a variety of ways to be able to. Uh, I, I guess, become successful or to have that same sort of mindset because the, the reality is different, right? I don't have to have that same level of, of risk taking the, the, the same way that you did. So how I have, that's one thing that I've had to adapt to is to try to change that mindset a little bit, which 
uh, I'm still learning how to do. But I, I notice that a lot for for the family businesses that we work with and the younger generation coming in is how do they have that same sort of mindset? And that can be a little bit of a challenge between the generations. I don't know if you have any thoughts on that, Dad. But yeah, and, and go that. back to uh, remember uh, that wonderful Dr. Jim Grubbin who spoke at our conferences. Mm-hmm. He calls it the immigrants to wealth, which is an interesting term because hmm. you have you have family members or people come in the wealth that, to Michael's point didn't create it, so they're like immigrants. I'm coming into something that it's just there. And how do I how do I adopt to that? So it's an interesting point, Michael, that that a lot of the a lot of the family members that walk into these these businesses might not have the same values that that it took to build the business. They have to be uh, taught that, or they might have the same motivation. So, and you've seen it already, Michael. With some families, the dynamics of every family member is different. Like my girls, Eric, as an example, I offered both my girls a role at Copper Beach. Mm-hmm. And they both said, Dad, we don't do math. <laughs> I think I said that before on the podcast. But, but, and, and I said, Hey, guys, I don't want you to ever think that you're not invited into the family business. Uh, you're always welcome to be in this business. I want, want the opportunity to, I want to present the opportunity to you because I don't want you ever coming back to me as your dad saying, You never gave me that opportunity. Mm-hmm. And, and to this day, they, they respect and they always say, listen, we, we know you and Michael in, in, in that world, we trust you. And most certainly when you're no longer here, we most certainly trust Michael. So, so it's that communication between the family members and the understanding of the leadership positions, the willingness to, to take part. I might not be motivated to do that, but that creeps into something that could be a jealousy issue as well. We've seen jealousy among some of the family members that, hey, you gave Jim a better opportunity than I did. You spent more time with him and not with me. And so therefore I feel bad. So the dynamics of the families are critical to understanding the bigger picture of the family. But that takes that mission statement. It takes communication from the leaders. It takes a, a team approach. Like every Tuesday, we have a team meeting here. And Michael will tell you, it's open up for every idea my team gets involved in every discussion. We we talk about every one of our families, what's needed, what what's what we need to follow up on, what's the you know what's the next step, or what do we have to uh, focus on, where the problems are, and we fix it as a team, not me telling everybody what to do. I often tell everybody here in my firm, I'm not your boss. <laughs> you have your little projects you work on. You have a role you take in this company. That's your business. Work the business. Mm-hmm. I don't want anything about it. <laughs> that's your business, but make sure that our clients are happy and everything, all the bills get paid and everybody's salaries go up every year. So, so when, when you look at the, the communication between the, the leadership positions and the employees, or in my case, it's all family to me, uh, but that's how we built Copper Beach. It's a family affair, how I look at it. Again, I, I don't know if that goes down the right road, Michael, but that's, that's, you know, that's how I think. Well, that's, that's how it is. Yeah. No, I think that that's, that's exactly right. Let me, okay, let, me, let me jump in real quick because sure. you brought up something that I, I think that a lot of business owners with children have an issue with, and that's bringing their kids into the business, whether the, the child is ready or not, right? I, I think that that's – early on in this podcast, you said that you and Michael had the discussion. Michael wanted to change what he was doing. He, wanted, he was interested in coming into the business. This is the steps that you need to do before you do that. So he became a JD. And then, again, asking what steps are next. How many times do you deal with families where they've brought children into the business that just don't belong there? Let's be honest. I mean, they're just not ready. They're not either they're not ready, they're not equipped, or they're not interested. And so you talk about that passion. John, when you started this business, you had to take risks. We talked about, you know, you spoke about that. Uh, and, And Michael, you didn't have to take as many risks because you weren't starting it. You were coming into something. Mm -hmm. These, a lot of kids, they've seen their parents in the, this business forever and they just kind of think it's, it, that's just how it works. It just runs, right? They don't see the blood, sweat, and tears that went into it in the first three, sure. five, ten years, right? And so how many times have you seen a family where the, the family is just struggling or the business is struggling because they've got children put in place where they shouldn't belong or the, the kids just don't have the motivation to do the work or have the work ethic that the parents do. And how do you help people overcome that? I know that that could be an entire podcast by itself, but oh, if yeah. you could touch on that, that would be great just because I think our listeners, there's somebody right now struggling with that. Yeah. I, it, and he, I'll answer it kind of differently from Michael more than likely, but there's a test that we give 
everyone. It's called the Colby Index. I, I don't mean to mm-hmm. push <laughs> Kathy Colby, but it's a great it's a great test that you take. You answer like thirty questions, and basically it comes back with a report that says genetically how you're what you're made of to do a certain business or a certain job or where your strengths are as a as a as an individual. It's mm-hmm. a genetic test. Basically, it's kind of interesting. I don't know if I'm saying the right words, Michael, but it tests where you really belong. And and when you look at the way I scored on that test, there's a there's a fact finder. There there's a there's four four quadrants: fact finder, implementer, quick start, and what was the other, Michael? Follow through. I Follow think through. Was the other one. Yeah. And if you look at the fact finder, the the first one, ten's your highest score, one's your lowest. I was a two. So that tells me that I am not good at structure or details of things. Mm-hmm. My my makeup is not that focused. I, I, I can't do that. So if you put me in front of a project that said, okay, put all these numbers on the spreadsheet for the next six months, I'd probably commit suicide because my, my, my brain and my body would not do well with that. Mm-hmm. The other one so that was a two, the, the implementer, I think it was a four. And that shows that I can implement projects and do certain things. Quick start was nine and a half. Mm. Now, if you understand the dynamics of a quick start, he's a he's a promoter, he's a speaker, he's a visionary, he's a guy that runs business. He, he's that person that has that dynamics of a of a of a uh, makeup that that's the position he should be in. Promote, create, do certain things, and not bog him down on the details. Now, if you look at Michael took the test and Colleen. They were seven on the on the fact finder, mm-hmm. so they're very detailed structure. So I'm trying to get at we build our process of getting everybody these tests and put them in the right positions. It's called the group Colby index. So you could do that as a start to determine if your child can do that job. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Is he generally make up or she genetically made up to do that? So that's a great test. There's other tests out there, but that's how I started, Michael. What, what 20 years ago we. Not 20, but I took them 20 years ago. I think it was almost 10. 20, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think so right out of college I took that for the first yeah, time. So, yeah, so it helps business owners and individuals understand how it fits. Now, we're thinking at another level. We want to have our clients take those tests because mm-hmm. how you communicate to the client is important because yeah. if I have an analytical person I'm speaking with and I don't worry about the details, I shouldn't be speaking to that person. Yep. Michael should be. Yeah. So there's a strategy here that if you look at dynamics of how you lead or how you teach or how you help them make the right decisions as children to come part of an enterprise, that could be the first step that's a very telling step that you could say to your son who wants to go out and market and play golf with the guy down the street and build business, but his makeup, he shouldn't be doing that. He should be doing research or doing marketing or whatever it might be uh, on, on the inside. Yeah. So it's, so it's really interesting. I, I, I know I r- rattled on about that, but that, that's, that's one idea that I would, I would say you should try. Yeah. I think that's a good foundation for what your question was, Eric, which is uh, how do you, how do you set up the next generation mm-hmm. for success? And th- that there's a lot that goes into that uh, on top of what you just said, dad, but having that foundation to understand how, each person is really made up, um, and that Colby index is a good way to do that. There's the predictive index. I've also taken that test, which I thought was pretty well done. But that can give you a foundation to be able to set up the next generation to be in a position for for success. As an example, to your point, Dad, I I don't think the way that you think. I don't have the same skill set that that you have, and vice versa. If the generation one is expecting the generation two to be a clone of them in terms of going through the same process, that might not be the best recipe for success because it's no matter how hard the next generation tries or how you know smart they are or how driven they are, sometimes it's it, there's just more that goes into that. There's in instincts or there's uh, things that in, are, are innate in that person that the next generation doesn't have. So I think that is one good tool that I think all family businesses sh- should take really for all the family members that are involved because it does give you that foundation to be able to put that next generation in in the best position. So in, ter- in my in my case, and we talk about this all the time, is that going to be a role that I take to, to try to become my dad? Well, I might be able to do that in some capacities, but probably not 
in the exact same way that he does it because that's that's his skill set. I'm not made up the same way. So we talk about does that mean we need to partner with somebody that maybe has more of my dad's skill set to kind of work alongside me. There's a lot of different avenues that a business can go down to make that work. So that's one thing I would say. And and also to your question, Eric, in terms of if the next generation, first of all, the next generation has to, I think, want to be a part of it. And that's something that requires honest dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, you know, it's really being pushed upon the second generation because Gen 1 really wants somebody in the next generation to take over the business, that sometimes isn't the best decision for a lot of weeks, but for, for the business and also for the family. You can imagine that oh, that... Yeah it causes a lot of tension. So you have to really want to have that family mindset in, in terms of owning the business long term. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I think that another thing that people run into is that the kids really like the income that they see their parents generating or that the lifestyle that they've grown accustomed to because of all their parents' hard work. And so they want to continue that for themselves, but they don't understand the hard work that goes into it. So sure. uh, again, we're, we're really low on time. We could go, man, I could, I could ask you guys questions for the next four hours, but I think our audience <laughs> would, would drive off a cliff at that point. So <laughs> we should probably wrap this one up, but I would love to continue this conversation on a future podcast if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a lot of fun. This is all, this is all very important stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Any closing thoughts from either one of you today before we wrap this up? Everybody stay safe. I know that uh, this virus is uh, getting everybody a little stressed, but everyone stay safe and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll all get through it. Absolutely. Yep, I, would, I would echo that as well. Everybody be safe. All right, guys. Thank you so much for your time. And I know Thanks, that Eric. you guys are being safe and please take care of those beautiful families. And uh, one of these days when this is all over, we're going to be able to get together and podcast in person, not from our respective basements and, you know, and, and enjoy each other's company for real. Well, that'd so, be a blast. That'd bring be a lot of fun. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. That sounds good to me. All right. And I want to thank each and every one of you for listening and tuning in to the truth about wealth podcast with John and Michael Paris. If you have not subscribed to the podcast yet, please click the subscribe now button below this way. When John and Michael come out with a new podcast, it'll show up directly on your listening device. This makes it much easier to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Again, thank you so much for listening today. For everyone at Copper Beach Financial Group, this is Eric Johnson reminding you to live your best day every day. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for listening to the Truth About Wealth podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of Copper Beach Financial Group. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. This material is for informational purposes only. Neither APFS nor its representatives provide tax, legal, or accounting advice. Please consult your own tax, legal, or accounting professional before making any decisions. Securities offered through American Portfolio Financial Services Incorporated, a member of FINRA SIPC Investment Advisory and Financial Planning Services offered through American Portfolio Advisors Incorporated, an SEC registered investment advisor. Copper Beach is an unaffiliated entity of APFS and APA. Any opinions expressed in this forum are not the opinion or view of American Portfolios Financial Services Incorporated APFS or American Portfolios Advisors Incorporated APA and have not been reviewed by the firm for completeness or accuracy. These opinions are subject to change at any time without notice. Any comments or postings are provided for informational purposes only and do not constitute an offer or a recommendation to buy or sell securities or other financial instruments. Readers should conduct their own review and exercise judgment prior to investing. Investments are not guaranteed, involve risk, and may result in a loss of principal. Past performance does not guarantee future results. Investments are not suitable for all types of investors.